Hello, folks and friends. Welcome back to World War II TV. It was a three-day break without me, so how did you cope? I hope you coped okay. But we have a cracking week of shows coming your way. So it's aviation and naval battles in the Pacific. So we've got Trent Hone coming on later on, Will Iredale, James M. Scott tomorrow with his latest book. But today, we're talking about Corsairs again. We did a show a few weeks ago with Henry Sledge and Damon Stout about the, Pel uh, the Peleliu uh, of Corsairs flying out of there. That was quite cool. But we're back again talking about Corsairs. My guest is a former Marine, a US uh, Marine tanker. He's a former school teacher, and he's also now the author of a book about the fighting Corsairs. So I'll bring Jeff Dacus in now. So good afternoon or good morning where you are, Jeff. How are you today? Doing well, Paul. Thank you. So I've got to ask you, you were in the Marines in tanks, but you're writing about aircraft how did the interest switch from the ground to the sky well um similar story to your background with world war ii when i was a young man back in the 1950s and 60s bantam and valentine had their little paperback world war ii books and i read uh, uh, the first and the last and uh, books like that about aviation and got interested, read uh, Black Sheep, and ran into a hardback book then about the same time about uh, Bob Hansen, a Marine fighter pilot who was the highest scoring Corsair pilot, scored uh, 25, was credited with 25 victories. And so I've always had a, an interest in him and an interest in uh, Corsairs being Marine. Uh, Corsairs are always identified with the Marines. And uh, we used them both as fighter planes and bombers and very efficient. So it's always been an interest of mine. And when I got older, uh, kind of read more about it. And in 1982, I decided that I would find out all I could about Bob Hansen. And in doing so, I met and corresponded with about 40 pilots that were associated with his squadron, VMF 215. And the idea for a book came and went to their reunions, uh, got to know the guys. And then I got married, had children, went to war, and kind of the thing went on back burner. And then I retired in 2015 from school teaching and uh, dusted it off the shelf and said, let's make this into a book. And I was fortunate enough to get it published then. Well, and you said it yourself there, if you if you were lucky enough to speak to 40 or so flyers from the units, then that's a really good start because, you know, with the younger historians who come on my channel these days in their twenties, the chances of now meeting people from any aspect of World War II, civilians, evacuees, pilots, ground crew, infantrymen, those days have pretty much passed us by now. So starting with that kind of database, really, really great way to, to begin a story. So I'll let my guest, as usual, has come loaded up with a PowerPoint. We'll put that up on screen now. We'll do questions kind of as we go along today, folks. If they're about the stuff on screen, kind of feel free to ask away. If there's any kind of big questions about the Pacific campaign or Corsairs generally as an aircraft, we can perhaps take them at the end. But we'll do kind of... Uh, a, a sequential set of questions we go along if you're new to world war ii tv i should have said it don't forget to click that subscribe button and all the information you need include the including the link to jeff's website and where you can purchase his books are in the description below below so don't forget to open that out and all the information you need is there so jeff i'm gonna hand it over to you and then i will jump in with comments every now and then and we'll have some questions from viewers so let's talk about the fighting corsairs Okay, let me get started by saying I watched uh, a video uh, about a month ago. John Buckley was one of your... Uh, oh, yeah, the legend, guests. yeah. And he talked about the fact that too often when we start talking about battles or, or particularly Normandy, he mentioned that you get lost in the details and they start talking about tanks and everything's about tanks and this tank can destroy that tank and all that. And you lose sight of a lot of other things, the overall campaign, the individual people. And so my focus is not so much on the Corsair, although much of my book is about the Corsair, but it's more about the men. Like I said, I met these guys, yep. uh, became friends with a lot of them, and they were a very important part of all the research on this. So my book focuses mostly on people. And so I'll be talking mostly about the people that made up the fighting Corsairs, the Marines that actually went to battle in the Corsair. Well, that suits us down to ground, but down to, because as 
often is the case when it gets into the aircraft themselves is that people start quibbling about which model number is the best and is it the one with the so-and-so engine with this and you never end up sorting out those arguments because the Spitfire fans still love the Spitfire the Corsair fans will always be a Corsair fan the Thunderbolt whatever it is so as fun as those conversations are, you're absolutely right. It's it, at the heart of any of these stories are the people. So we'll we'll sit back and listen. So back to you again. Okay. Well, the first person we have to talk about is a guy named Jim Nephis, and he was their first commander. He was also the first Marine pilot to be credited with downing an enemy plane in World War II. He was stationed at Midway and flying a Brewster Buffalo, which all of your viewers I no, have various ideas. The Finnish did well with the Brewster, but the Navy and Marines uh, hated the little barrel. And so he was stationed at Midway, and not long after Pearl Harbor, a Japanese Mavis four-engine uh, scout plane flew near Midway, and Jim Nephus with his three fellow division uh, members attacked and shot down the Mavis. And so he was credited with the first kill of the war for the Marines. After that, he was sent stateside and he met up with uh, VMF 215 and he will be the first commander of the squadron. And basically, if any success is credited to 215, it has to be given to Jim Nephis because he, uh, they called him Gentleman Jim and he was their leader. There's no doubt that he would be their leader. Uh, the second personality that we have to deal with is Bob Owens. And Bob Owens will be the first executive officer. He was stationed at Iwa Air Station in Hawaii on uh, December 7th. And basically all the Marine planes were destroyed by the Japanese that were there at Iwa. And he was, that was his first experience at war. He took over basically command of all the aircraft at the station, including Navy, Marine, whatever. And he was uh, singled out as a great leader and then sent to Santa Barbara, California, where he met up with Jim Nephis. And they start basically VMF 215. It was originally a place called Goleta, and it's a suburb of Santa Barbara. And they had just built a new ter terminal for the airlines there. The Army had some P-40s stationed there. But the Army kind of left and said, we'll leave it to the Marines. And it will end up being uh, uh, Marine Corps Air Station Santa Barbara. And throughout the war, will train Marine pilots to go off to war. And especially Corsair pilots. It will be a training area for Corsairs as well as Avengers and other buildings, but this are planes. And this is where they're going to start. Uh, it was, uh, they had to build everything from scratch. There were no barracks. The army had put up a couple hangars. There was a giant pig farm where they slaughtered pigs and there was a definite smell. Half the field was overrun by water part of the time. They had to change all that. They had to build PXs, chapels, movie, everything had to be built. All they had was this one building with the nice new terminal, but uh, the rest of the facilities, the Marines had to build it themselves. And this is a picture of uh, the buildings. And you can see that they have other uh, B-25, uh, some uh, SNJ trainers, other aircraft there in the picture on the right. On the picture on the left, you can see the first Corsair that Jim Nephis flew in from San Diego and it's being sent to the flight line on the right is a Wildcat. They were flying when they first started the squadron, they were flying anything they could get their hands on, biplane fighters, uh, Wildcats, uh, SNJ trainers, anything they could get their hands on to try and build up flying time because many of the pilots were fresh out of flight school and it was people like Owens and Nephus and a few other veterans that are going to train these guys and get them ready to go over in a brand new airplane. And, and here we can kind of go aside and talk about the Corsair is brand new. It's This is uh, January 1943. It hasn't been sent overseas yet. It hasn't been in combat. And the biggest problem with the Corsair will be all the little teething problems. And anybody that's familiar with the Corsair knows it's got a big, long nose. And 
it's hard to see when you're taxing you have to s it's like a spitfire has that long nose yeah. and you have to s turn as you uh, go on the ground it was uh, difficult to land difficult to fly and it won't be allowed on carriers uh, large scale in the United States until 44 but the British they needed airplanes and they put it on carriers as soon as they got it and they were able to use it uh, right away. But the Marines, they're learning and they're going to get it on the ground. They're not going to use it on carriers for a long while. And as they get their Corsairs and begin to build up, eventually they will get 18. That's a squadron total. And these are the very early first version F4U1. They have what's called a bird cage. And here's a picture of it. If you notice the pilot, he has all kinds of little bars and things across his to uh, inhibit his visibility. But it's a great airplane from a point of view of performance. So they're going to put up with all the little teething troubles. They're going to fix the visibility by raising the tail wheel and raising the pilot's seat so that he can see a little better over the front. Uh, they're going to fix spin problems by attaching a little wood block to one of the wings. And these men of uh, 215, they have to do these changes as they go and as they learn. Many of them are going to uh, crash. And uh, Woe and uh, the poor guy that crashes one of these Corsairs because they only had a few. And uh, Jim Nephis was, uh, did not suffer fools easily. So and this, the, the, as they were working out the teething problems, was it kind of a collaborative thing where the, the, the aircraft manufacturers and the designers and the people delivering them kind of worked with the pilots and it was a, you know, everybody trying to find these solutions from all directions or was it a bit, but a bit of kind of um, hostility, but a bit of friction at the beginning? No, it was a very big collaborative effort. In fact, uh, uh, Vought representatives were there, the Pratt & Whitney that built the engine, they had representatives there alongside the Marines. In addition, they had people like John Smith and Marion Carl who had flown Wildcats at Guadalcanal and fought the Japanese. And they were there to teach them how to not only fly the Corsair, but the different techniques to use against the Japanese. Because despite, and we talked about how some people like the Zero and some people like Spitfire and stuff. Yep. Many people said, well, as soon as they got the Corsair, they just chopped the, the Japanese up. It was real easy. Well, that's not true. The Japanese uh, Zero was still a formidable airplane at that time. Very maneuverable. You had to be careful. They had some excellent pilots left over. They'd suffered a lot of losses, but they still had good pilots. So people like Mary and Carl, they learned how to fly the Corsair. And it's, Joe Foss was another one. Mm. They came to Santa Barbara and taught them what's the best way to fight a zero and use the abilities. The Corsair was just a screaming. It, it could uh, 50 miles an hour faster than the zero. It could dive and lose a zero very easily. In fact, many of these guys that got in a pickle with three or four zeros on their tail, all they did was put the nose down and just let it go, and, and it could outrun the zero. But if you tried to turn with the zero or just climb straight, up a zero had the advantage even uh later model corsairs the zero still had a lot of things and they had to learn these things as well as learn how to fly the corsair and do you think it was an advantage that some of these pilots have been on wildcats and buffaloes and things like that in that if you've had a bit of experience with different aircraft and in different types of combat in the early era when the japanese were having the upper hand at, le at the very least you're gaining experience and you're kind of learning what doesn't work I, I think that's true because the Wildcat, American planes throughout the war will have an advantage over most other countries. The, the Hellcat and the Wildcat were built so-called the Grumman Ironworks because they were so tough and the Corsair is tough. The Buffalo, for all being a, a yucky little non-performing aircraft, was a tough airplane. Yeah. American aircraft tended to dive faster the p40 uh claire chenault with the flying tigers said if you get in trouble put it in the dive don't try to dogfight the japanese and twist and turn and loop with them just if you're in trouble you just put the nose down and american planes were so heavy and so well built 
that you can usually outdive Japanese. That was a big advantage. And when these pilots that did have the experience came and uh, talked to the pilots at 215, that's the first thing they taught them. You may have an airplane that goes a lot faster than the Japanese, but you got to make sure you use the right tactics. Good. We've got a question from one viewer from Canopus44. Was Jim Nephus attached to the squadron that got badly shot up in the Battle of Midway? If so, it sounds like he was lucky to be sent home before the battle. So is it the same? Is it was he attached to that? Yep. Okay. It's the exact same squadron. Yes, he was sent out, and the Battle of Midway then will take place in June. He left the squadron in May so that he did not have to endure, yeah, getting wiped out. Good. Okay, well, back to you. So we've got no more questions at the time being. Just lots of comments about aircraft. People are joining in, Great Dominion and Bradley and Benjamin, as they always do. I shall go back and read the sidebar later. But, but back to you, Jeff, this is great. This is uh, the picture of the, the pilots finally at the beginning of 1943 are going to ship out, and they're going to go to Hawaii. And this is a group photo. A lot of these pilots will transfer out or go to different squadrons along the way, or they will be in uh, flying accidents. Uh, but basically the squadron makes it to Hawaii. And while they're in Hawaii, they do a lot of training. This is one division led by a pilot named Hap Langstaff, who was a longtime Marine Corps pilot, excellent pilot, retired as a colonel. And this is his division flying around the Hawaiian islands. They spent several weeks in Hawaii, and this gave them a chance to work out all the tactics. And the Marine Corps four planes is a division, two planes was a section, and so they would do section and division tactics. They weren't so worried about the uh, squadron, that kind of stuff. They were more interested in uh, sticking together, teamwork. They had learned, one of the things they learned from uh, Joe Foss and the others was you never fly alone. If you're caught by yourself, get out of there because the Japanese uh, will get you. So they always tried to stay in pairs. Uh, and of course, this is known in Europe by now, the finger four and all that's being done way ahead of our guys learning it. But uh, four planes or two planes was the basic formations that they fought in. Uh, some of the pilots wanted to join early. This is Don Aldrich, who will be one of the high scoring members of the uh, squadron. And he wanted to join the Navy and become a pilot pre uh, December 7th, 1941. And he was married. And unfortunately, Marjorie is uh, kind of going to be a handicap because they would not allow married pilots in the uh, Marine Corps or Navy. And so he went to Canada, and he became a member of the RCAF and learned to fly in Canada. And when uh, the United States declared war on Japan, he came back to the United States and then joined the Marine Corps and will be one of the uh, first pilots with uh, 215. And another, like I said, I'm going to be doing a lot of talking about individuals. This is Perfect. another pilot, uh, Doc Spears. He's going to be the third highest squadron score and unfortunately throughout this thing i'm going to be talking about scores and when we do fighter pilots we tend to kind of fix on scores so uh, forgive me if i use that as a measuring stick but uh, uh, doc spears uh, one of the most rude crude uh, individuals you've ever met uh, he always had a story uh, he would start out a story by saying well i met this whore down in san francisco and that everybody knew what was coming next. He had usual ribald stories of his adventures with uh, women and that kind of thing. He very uh, good pilot though, well respected by the other members. You just had to watch out when you're on liberty with the guy because uh, chances are you're going to have some kind of trouble either with uh, wives or with boyfriends or something. And then the uh, third ranking member of the squadron was a man named uh, Art Warner. And he got his name Thrifty because he was a salesman when uh, before the war. And he was the guy that always had a prank going. He had a witty story. He was a fun-loving guy. Uh, one of the real uh, guys that kind of provided levity to keep 
the seriousness of war away from everybody. And he pulled some really good pranks. Uh, when we get to Midway, I'll tell you about a prank that Warner pulled on the uh, XO. But another one, of the, he was an ace pilot. All these guys are aces. They shot down more than five planes. So they're not only uh, individuals, but they were very good flyers and fighters. And this is Midway. They went from Hawaii to Midway Island. Now, this is uh, probably seven, eight months after the Battle of Midway. So it's really built up. There are permanently stationed uh, fighter squadrons there armed with Corsairs. They're not armed with Buffaloes or Wildcats anymore. They've got the most advanced planes now. And so they're going to go to Midway from Hawaii. And while at Midway, they're going to practice all the things that they'll need to know. It's, it's considered a forward area. So when they fly their patrols in the morning, they're looking for Japanese snoopers. They're looking for submarines. They're semi in the war. It's, a, it's the front line. And they will, again, work on squadron, division, section tactics. They'll get to know the course there more. And above all, they'll learn navigation. And Hawaii and Midway, navigation out over the ocean was very important. Naval pilots have a big uh, problem with the navigation. There's nothing on the ground for them. There's no landmarks. When you go out for your sector to patrol in the morning, you've got to be able to figure out. And in those days, it was dead reckoning. There was very little radio signals that they could use to find their way back. It was basically dead reckoning. And these pilots, and they're, they're by themselves in a cockpit. They don't have a, a co-pilot. They don't have a navigator. Uh, so they're, they're learning navigation. In fact, in their journey from Hawaii to Midway, they had uh, C-47s, R-4Ds that the uh, Navy provided to, as navigation guides for them so they didn't have to worry about it because you're talking about seven hour flights over water and that would be very difficult so an airplane that had a dedicated navigator and had radio homing devices uh, would lead them and uh, you see here they're in front of their uh, club it's called the pirate's den you'll notice that the corsair being a pirate like name for their airplane the fighting Corsairs, uh, other squadrons like BMF 214 was called the Swashbucklers, and they had this piratical uh, sense about them. On Midway, um, Art Warner, the guy I was telling you about, Thrifty Warner, the prankster, he went and they lived in bunkers. And so what he did was he took a uh, bunch of seagulls they're called goonie birds in this area and these goonie birds and he stuffed the xo's little bunker sleeping area with hundreds of goonie birds and locked them in and shut the door and when the uh, xo got back from his flight with his division and he opened the door needless to say he was attacked by several dozen goonies they left uh, their waist behind. They left feathers behind. And, of course, uh, Art Warner uh, pretty soon was, uh, what would you say, some kind of uh, incognito type of guy. He just disappeared because he knew that there would be retribution. So that's an example of uh, the type of things that he did. And I'll ask you the same question I asked um, Damon Stout and, and Henry Sledge a few weeks ago. And when you're talking about Marine flyers compared to Navy flyers, now the Marine Corps has a reputation, obviously kind of kind of the fierceness of the training and there's a kind of a discipline attitude, but also kind of a, there's an irreverence as well. There's a, you know, the fact they can kind of joke and things is, do you think there is a fundamental difference between Marine flyers and Navy flyers in their kind of attitudes and demeanor? I think that uh, basically they're all Navy aviators. In fact, yeah. uh, several of these guys joined 215 in Santa Barbara right after doing carrier qualifications. So they are Navy aviators. But the Marines have a link to their ground uh, brothers that's yeah. much different than Naval Flyers. Uh, often um, Marine aviators serve in ground units and command ground units. In fact, the only uh, 
Marine Corps officer to command a field army in history. Uh, Roy Geiger commanded uh, the army on uh, Okinawa. He was uh, one of the original Marine flyers. He was an aviation officer. So, and especially when uh, they began to support the Marine ground troops, the Marine aviators will serve on the ground, radioing signals, providing uh, forward air control for that. There's a distinct link between uh, Marine flyers and uh, the ground troops. Uh, Chesty Puller, the, the famous uh, Marine who earned five Navy crosses, he once saw a Corsair and said, where do you put the bayonet? So it's kind of, we all work together. We're all yeah. the same. Uh, and so that's the big difference between naval aviators. But I think there is a, a kind of uh, irreverence among all naval aviators. Okay. Great answer. Okay. Uh, this is kind of the combat zone where they, where they will serve their entire time. And I don't know if, does my arrow show up? It probably doesn't. No, not, not. But we can, you can describe where you're looking at. Yeah. On the right uh, toward the bottom, you can see Guadalcanal, yep. and that will be their first station. They will be stationed at Guadalcanal. They will fly missions up the slot, as you see there. Any of you familiar with the Guadalcanal campaign, all the islands that were familiar to pilots during that time, they will fly their first tour. Each, each Marine fighter squadron flew three six-week tours. They call them flights. So their first flight of six weeks will be flying escort missions, fighter missions, uh, Dumbo cover, which is rescue aircraft covering them as they recover flyers. Uh, all their flying will be done around the slot area on up uh, to New Georgia and up toward the end of the slot where uh, just south of Bougainville. They're not going to do much with Bougainville during their first flight. They rarely encounter enemy aircraft. So it's not really fighter versus fighter that they're going to be doing. What they're going to be doing their first time is strafing ground positions, uh, supporting ground troops, shooting up barges and Japanese supply vessels that are going up and down this chain of islands. And that's where they're going to do most of their fighting. They're also going to, again, learn about the Corsair, learn how to use it in combat. This is very important that they were kind of got a soft touch. Uh, they didn't have that much aerial combat. They were able to learn how to fly the Corsair and become very familiar with it. This is an important, crucial time in uh, World War II in the Pacific. The Japanese have lost the Guadalcanal, and now there's a transition. We're going to go on the offensive. Now we are the people that Guadalcanal has since you know, we're going and we're going to go right up to Rabaul on New Britain. Uh, MacArthur has started his offensive in New Guinea. He's moving up the coast of New Guinea uh, to the uh, west of the Solomons. So we are now on the offensive. But this is an advantage to the Japanese then. They're able to fight defensively. They're able to have short supply lines yep. and uh, operate over their own airfields and this is an advantage to them, but again, it's, it's a transitional time and the Japanese have been defeated, but they're not broken yet. And that's going to happen during 215's time in the Solomons. The Japanese naval air arm will be destroyed by the Rabaul campaign. And, and I don't talk a lot about strategy in, in my book, but that is one thing I do talk about is this is the death knell of Japanese naval aviation because they land base their planes throughout the Solomons and on New Britain, and they will lose their veteran pilots. They will lose their best in fighting this new offensive from uh, the Americans, New Zealanders, and other allies going up the Solomons. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, again, members of 215. This is on Guadalcanal when they first got there, and they're just becoming familiar with it. Uh, the man on the left is a very important person that I have to bring up because for every Marine or Navy squadron, this guy is your key. His name was Ernest Niebuhr. He was a, a family physician back in North Carolina. When the war started, the Navy said, hey, 
you are now in the Navy, you're going to be a flight surgeon, and he will be the father confessor, the brother, the father, son, uh, best friend, everything to these pilots. When they've had a tough mission, he would meet them at the end of the mission. He's the guy that provided those little bottles, like the airline bottles of uh, uh, different types of uh, alcohol. He would uh, talk to them about their experiences. Somebody that they knew got killed. He was the guy that uh, kind of brought them all around. He was the key figure for the squadron outside of their leadership. He's the guy that keeps the squadron together. And every probably every Marine squadron's doc was this way. And Doc Nebo was the soul of VMF 215. The other flyers there, George Cross, Hap Langstaff, and Chief Lou, uh, they flew, uh, those three guys flew as a division uh, for the whole, whole uh, time that 215 spent in the combat area. And that's another good thing. To be with the same guys that you were in Santa Barbara with is very, very helpful. The only big change influx of people that they had was a few guys were added at Midway. For instance, uh, Hal Spears joined them at Midway. Uh, and then after the end of each of their six-week flights, they will get people from other squadrons that will join. Um, at the end of their first six-week flight, they're going to get all the guys from VMF 214, the swashbucklers, their squadron was basically disbanded and ex all the pilots that were there were either assigned to 215 or just left in a pool. And of course, any of you that are familiar with the black sheep, uh, that is where uh, Boyington will get basically most of his squadron will be these old 214 swashbucklers that were put in a pool and they will change their name then after Boyington takes over from swashbucklers to the black sheep. But a lot of those guys, including Bob Hansen, the highest scorer, he started in 214, but ends up flying his last two flights with 215. And we've got a question about in this in this uh, these early stages, what are their losses like? Well, unfortunately, there were there were quite a few losses, and they were not good losses. They were losses that uh, the, the first squadron loss. Uh, the man who, uh, Gerald Pickerel, was uh, the first guy that was lost. They're flying along in their formations. They're going on an uh, escort mission. And all of a sudden, everybody looks over, and this guy's plane is just jetting up higher than the whole formation. And people don't know, well, what's he doing? And then he comes back down, and, and his uh, wingman, uh, Tom Stockwell, he says, Okay, where you go, I go. And so then all of a sudden, the plane would take off again and go two or 3,000 feet above the formation and then dip back down and kind of join the formation, but go lower. And the whole time, Stockwell is going along with his, his section leader. He's following every movement. And then this went on for several minutes. And then uh, his plane just began to go down, 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 and Stockwell's following him and following him and following him. It just goes straight into the sea. And they determined later that it was faulty oxygen. And so he uh, was unable to breathe and lost consciousness and went into the sea. Another one, they're flying along, uh, just preparing to go into the combat area, escorting bombers. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, a zero comes flying through the formation and shoots down one of them and disappears before anybody has a chance to react. And they said that it was going, uh, I believe, 450 knots, which uh, a uh, zero probably uh, would not be able to do, but that's what they said. It, it just went through so fast, nobody knew what to do, and, and they lost another member. Most of the members of 215 that died, died due to accidents or uh, something Odd. They, uh, I think only three were lost in actual one-on-one -on -one combat, and several were lost, and and they were probably shot down by Japanese, but we're we're not sure. They just simply disappeared. Okay. Thank you. And this Sammy Stidger is. Uh, 
he's the guy that the squadron just the, everybody loved this guy. He is just the most loved member of the squadron. And he was the ladies man. Uh, when they were in Santa Barbara, he went to a laundry and there were two women that ran the laundry. Well, uh, he would go there and he would take one of the women out and uh, while her sister ran the laundry. And then the next day he would come back and take the other sister out. And then uh, he just continued this. And one of the Marines remarked to me, he said, Sammy always had the best pressed uniforms of the entire squadron. And he's kind of that way. He, he nearly broke up a marriage in Australia. He uh, just a, a, a wild, carefree, uh, what we would call today, free spirit kind yeah. of guy. He uh, loved to fly. Uh, his death will be caused because he loved to fly so much that he just wouldn't say no. And he uh, died flying a plane that probably shouldn't have been flown but he wanted to get back into the action. So he was flying a plane from the rear areas forward and uh, died in an accident. But he's the lifeblood guy of the squadron. Uh, this is, as they moved up from Guadalcanal, uh, their second tour, they're gonna move up to New Georgia. And this area, Vela La Vela, New Georgia, Rendova, Columbangara, all these areas, if you're familiar with uh, President Kennedy's uh, PT-109, uh, it sank right off uh, Kalamangaro and Gizo. They're in the Gizo Straits where it was actually hit by a Japanese destroyer. And this is uh, terrible jungle fighting. The New Georgia campaign is uh, just the worst kind of fighting you can be in. Dysentery, disease, uh, snakes, scorpions, the Japanese were the least of the problems. And as soon as the uh, air base at Munda Point, which is the center of your picture there at the southern tip of New Georgia, Munda Point, uh, just above Rendova, the, uh, the Marines of 215 were the first to land there. And it was being contested at the time. And so oh. their tents were shredded by artillery, by machine gun fire. They dug trenches. Next. In addition to being bombed, they were getting ground fire. Uh, Roger Conant, one of the uh, guys I knew really well from the squad and the guy that really got me going with these guys, he said that uh, he and his division were sitting on the Munda runway and they were just sitting waiting for the uh, scramble order. And they noticed 105 millimeter shells landing at the far end of the runway and they were slowly working their way down the runway right toward their four planes that were parked there and he said when they got within about 100 yards of their planes they vacated their aircraft and headed for the slit trenches so the Japanese had the field under fire most of the time and of course the living conditions for the pilots that were there you've got to imagine this is the front line. On Guadalcanal, they had somewhat uh, permanent, uh, you know, floors in their tents. They had Quonset Hut buildings for maintenance. They had Quonset Huts for mess hall. On Monday, it was sea rations. It was the basics. Uh, they, they got disease. Every one of them had uh, diarrhea. They had all kinds of conditions. Doc Niebuhr sent me a letter that detailed uh, in depth, the half these guys shouldn't have been flying. They were just totally uh, suffering. One, one of them lost 70 pounds, if you can believe that. He was over 200 okay. pounds and just lost, and they're emaciated. They would uh, rotate back to Guadalcanal for some good chow and a good night's sleep uh, and safety. And that's going to be the way for them basically for the rest of their tour they're going to move on to fly out of Vela La Vela, and that will be a basic thing again, still under Japanese fire, still uh, primitive conditions. And finally, their last uh, place that they will fly from is Bougainville, and it will be under fire. In fact, at one time, the Japanese almost overran the entire uh, Bougainville complex of three airfields. So uh, they're out in the dirt with, it's not like uh, the 8th Air Force in England 
coming back uh, after a terrible mission and you know cinema and pub yeah cinema yeah. and pub and girls yeah i mean but this you know you made the point earlier jeff that you know your book doesn't have too much of the strategy and the overviews in it but this you know just exactly while the, why while these pilots are experiencing these terrible conditions and dysentery and diarrhea and health and things like that, this is exactly when the benefit of having these squadrons right there in the field with the Marines on the ground who need them is paying dividends. That is when ground air support is absolutely becoming a skill and a tool that the allies were using to win the war. And, you know, when you're reading someone like, I don't know, Ian W. Dahl or John McManus talking about the winning of the Ireland campaign, and they talk about an incoming a, you know, a squadron of Corsairs giving close air support. Sometimes those books always don't, don't kind of get across what you're saying, which is that these pilots are taking off from airfields, you know, 500 yards behind the targets they're, 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 they're putting rockets on. Yep. It's, and they're learning as they go. And, and again, their second tour will be spent at Munda. And that second tour, uh, six week tour, they go to Australia for a few weeks in between, but that tour is almost all going to be ground support. There is very little aerial fighting. The Japanese are husbanding their resources. They're getting ready for the invasion of Bougainville. And so they there's very little inner air action. So it's not that they're building up big scores, you know, uh, fighting uh, the Japanese in the air. This is mostly ground support. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. Well, back to you. Uh, this is a picture of them on Guadalcanal. They've adopted their... Uh, if you see their symbol there in the middle, they started then on Midway, the fighting Corsairs with the pirate in the middle of the uh, picture. And they're getting ready to go back to Australia in that picture. And when they come back and go to Munda, they're going to begin attacking Bougainville. And if you look at Bougainville here and you can see, I'm not sure how clear it is, but those squares with little propeller looking things, those are the Japanese airfields. So you got Balali down there at the very bottom, Kahili all the way up to Buka on Buka Island in the very far north. And so these airfields, the Army Air Force, the New Zealanders, the uh, Marines, the Navy, uh, they're all attacking these airfields, doing as much as they can to prep for the invasion of Bougainville. And this is where there will be uh, a lot of action, not a lot of air-to-air -air action. Uh, uh, Hal Spears destroys three Japanese float planes at one time. Rakata Bay is part of uh, this area. And they're taking out anything they can, gun positions, uh, barges that are bringing supplies south. Uh, they're trying to choke off as much as they can of the uh, Japanese supply for Bougainville and starve them out. And it's during this time... This term, don't strafe Kahili. Kahili is the is at the very bottom of Bougainville there on the uh, so southern tip there. And this is where most of the Japanese on Bougainville were located. Hundreds of Japanese planes would stage through there to attack uh, positions on New Georgia, even as far south as Guadalcanal. And so that was a main target. But they wanted the Marines didn't have that much. Uh, they didn't have bomb kits yet for their Corsairs, didn't have rockets. So you had to go in and strafe. And this was just terrible. You go, you fly down, you got to go straight and level for a little bit to line up the Japanese planes and any aircraft guns. And during that time, uh, you're just a, a moving target right there. There you are. And it's easy for, for them to be shot down. Uh, this is uh, Bob Owens is the first guy to land on Monday. You can see the trees in the background have been yes. stripped with foliage. Yeah. Yeah. This is, they're the first planes to land on the new runway. And then uh, back to Bougainville from Munda, uh, Bob Owens led a flight of five planes, two from uh, VMF 214 and three from 215. And they flew up to attack. Bougainville and they were going to attack Kahili. Now, everybody, when you got there to Munda, they always said, don't let them talk you into strafe and Kahili. Don't go there. Don't go there. And so they did. They were assigned the mission to do it. The two planes from 214 would strafe the runway while Owens and the two guys from 215 would provide air cover. And it was kind of cloudy day. 
There were two other planes that were supposed to be there. They disappeared. So out of the seven, five are going to actually get to Kahili. And this guy, Alvin Jensen from 214, he goes in on a strafing run and he just finds the place packed with aircraft. And he just starts strafing from one end to the other, uh, blowing up zero fighters, uh, Betty bombers, uh, Val dive bombers. And in the end, when they go back and photograph it, they give him credit for destroying 24 Japanese airplanes on the ground. They found 24 burned out. Now, the other two pilots that disappeared, some people have said, well, maybe one of them got in there and, and got some of those. But Jensen was credited with those 24 planes. The wow. two missing pilots, one of them from 215 uh, Hazelwood, he became a prisoner of the Japanese at Rabaul, and he was worked to death. He was starved to death. After the war, they found out he was listed as missing during the war. But after the war, they found that he had been starved and brutalized uh, to death, along with uh, a 214 pilot named Lamphere. And if you're familiar with uh, Admiral Yamamoto's death, uh, Lamphere was one of the guys that claimed to have shot down Yamamoto. His brother was a Marine pilot who uh, ended up dying, being starved to death at Rabaul, along with Hazelwood from 215. Uh, but Jensen, he's, I'd say he was an ace. He shot down seven planes, but he got 24 on the ground at one time. Well, I mean, we, then, we did a show about the death of um, Yamamoto earlier, about a year ago. And um, just to interrupt you again, because I like interrupting people. When you're talking about these you know, flights of five going off into the air, by this point, as you say, they're doing ground attack. They're, 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 on, the, they're on the patrol in case there are any air, any aircraft, but there aren't that many. They're also looking for target is opportunity on the, in, the, in, the, in the water, so barges and landing craft and ships. And so. Was it a case of all the pilots having to be good at all of those sets of skills or did they kind of allocate within a flight well if if we you know you'll do the ground job while you keep an eye on the sea how did it kind of work or were they all just all rounders no the op the operations officer would assign the night before he would assign the pilots the following day and unlike europe where you see pictures of uh, uh gabby gabreski's uh p47 with his personal stuff on it and kills and all that the night before you were assigned a plane, they just right. said, you're going to take number 571. And so you didn't know if your plane was going to be, they had some that they called the goat. You knew you didn't want to fly that plane because it was always coming back. You always had to abort. It was the worst plane, but uh, you were assigned a mission and you were assigned a plane the night before. And then the next morning you would go out. And so they had to learn on the job training uh, the different types of things they had to adapt. They knew how to fire the guns. They knew how to strafe. They knew how to do that. But now to a, the, the barges are camouflaged. They had to learn how to find them, watch the shadows. Is that shadow wrong? Has it got palm fronds on it or something? And so it was definitely um, whatever you were assigned. And there were small numbers. At this time, the Japanese outnumber the Americans and New Zealanders in this area. They have as many planes as the Americans and, and allies have. And so you're sending out dribs and driblets. When they fly a mission, it's not 100 bombers like they fly out of England. You're flying five or six B-25s or, or five or six SBDs or Avengers or whatever the bomber. These are really pitiful numbers that they're sending out. And uh, you, you have to send small numbers because you only have a small amount. You got 10 missions. They're doing a small landing on Kalabangara or Choisel or someplace, and you have to spread your planes out. So uh, very small numbers. Division was the big thing. You stayed with your four planes. That was the most important thing. All right. Okay. And the next uh, – person. This is not a member of 215. This is Ken Walsh, who retires a general, one of the greatest American uh, fighter pilots, shot down 21. He was uh, credited with 21 Japanese planes. He, uh, the Marines are at, at Munda, 215s at Munda. 
Walsh's plane has some problems. And so he lands and asks, you know, Nephus, he says, can I borrow one of your planes on alert? Just take one of your planes. Sure, take the plane. So he flies off. He's got to catch up with the bombing formation that's going up to Bougainville. And he catches up. And right as he catches up, he sees Japanese planes attacking the bombers from behind. Well, he attacks the Japanese from behind. And he knocks down three of them very quickly. He breaks up the attack. The Japanese scatter when this one Corsair appears out of nowhere and just starts sweeping them with machine gun fire. Uh, who knows how many he actually hit. He got credit for three. And then he gets jumped by four or five zeros. And he puts the nose down and heads out of the area as fast as a Corsair will go. He eventually out strips him because of the speed difference. And unfortunately, he suffered so many hits to his plane that he had to crash land off Munda and a boat had to come out and get him. Nephus was not happy that he, you know, destroyed his plane. You know, you give us this wreckage of your plane and took our good scramble plane and now it's in the drink. But Walsh was given the Medal of Honor for breaking up the Japanese attack, uh, flying one of 215's planes. So it's kind of these guys they're associated with uh, are like Jensen and Ken Walsh, even though they're not 215. They're rubbing shoulders with the best of the best. Mm. And how did they get on with the, uh, the ground crews? Because it came up in the sidebar about maintaining aircraft in the climate. And it's come up on previous World War II TV shows because, you know, maintaining aircraft in combat is difficult anyway. But the Pacific just compounds that because of dust and heat and humidity and, and all the other kind of insects and everything else. And so, so did the pilots form close bonds with the ground crew? They had a great bond with their ground crew until they got into combat. When they got to Guadalcanal, their ground crews were shipped out to another squadron. Mm. They had no ground crew of their own for the rest of the war. Wherever they went, they used who was ever there. So they had CBs. They had ground Marines. They had the pilots. They did all the maintenance on their own planes. When they were lucky uh, at Munda and eventually at Vela La Vela and Torquina, they are going to have uh, what are called uh, carrier aviation units, uh, CAVUs, that are provided by the Navy, and they do general maintenance for any airplane. And so these uh, CAVUs would end up at an airfield, CAVU, and they would then support 215. So their uh, ground crews ended up with a Navy squadron. If uh, They're called VF-17, and they were famous uh, on their own uh, the, as the highest scoring Navy squadron of this time. Uh, they were led by, um, you know, I'm forgetting who, oh, I was going to say Tommy Blackburn's uh, squadron. And so they ended up servicing a Navy squadron for the rest of their time there. And they received high compliments from Blackburn. He said that he had 95% operational rate at all times because of 215's ground crews. And he even had an anecdote. He once told Bob Owens, he said, uh, one time I got an airplane and I looked out and there was no propeller on it. And he said, I got to go. It's, it's the mission's taking off. And they said, don't worry, commander. By the time you take off, everything will be just right. And, it, you know, they got the propeller on, got him going, and away he went. And so uh, they, they had a lot of different ground crews, so they didn't have their own. Okay, brilliant response. Thank you. Uh, this is Bob Hansen, who started out as a member of uh, 214, the Swashbucklers, who will later be the Black Sheep. And after his first six-week tour, he came back. 214 had been disbanded. They assigned him to 215. And with 215, he will shoot down. Uh, eventually, his total will be 25. He got three with uh, uh, 214, the rest with 215. The highest scoring Corsair pilot, purely Corsairs. He only flew Corsairs. And uh, he was kind of a, 
uh, loner at first. When he first got there, he was kind of a he was born in India. He spoke several different languages. He traveled the world. He'd been in Austria in 1938 when the Anschluss uh, took place. He was a, a really uh, cosmopolitan kind of guy. And uh, he was a, the light heavyweight champion wrestler of India. So he was a big, strong guy, kind of formidable. And so he was kind of a loner. People, uh, he took off on his own after Japanese planes, uh, but he did break up a big attack. He, he won the Medal of Honor for breaking up an attack off Bougainville. But he gradually became part of 215. And next thing you know, he's uh, Roger Conant, one of the smaller guys in the squadron, used to hide when Hanson was around because Hanson would always want to wrestle with him. And he would seek him out and say, let's wrestle. And Conant was a uh, wrestler at the University of Wisconsin, but he didn't want to go up against a guy over 200 pounds. He was 160. And so uh, they were, you know, hilarious together, the two of them uh, acting out things. And unfortunately, he will die uh, February 3rd, 1944, uh, after strafing a radar station on uh, uh, New Ireland on the way back from a mission to Rabaul. And this is uh, typical of how bad things can get. Uh, this young pilot, the guy second from the left, uh, Jake Knight, uh, on the left is Bob Owens, who at the time is the executive officer again, and Doc Niebuhr, always there when something's going on. And they had one interim guy between Owens and Mephis. The man on the left is uh, Williamson. He will be their uh, commander for just one tour. But they're giving Knight a hard time because I told you they lost most of their planes non-combat. He flew up to Rabaul, fought the battles up in Rabaul, but hung around too long in Rabaul and ran out of gas within sight of Munda Airfield. So they're giving him a hard time for uh, running out of gas, not even being shot down, uh, kind of a humbling experience. And their last tour will focus on Rabaul, which is the actual focus of the entire campaign, uh, Operation Cartwheel, the isolation of Rabaul. At Rabaul, there's five major airfields, and there are over 100,000 troops here. And so when looking at it, the, the Joint Chiefs said, we don't want to invade an island place with jungles and disease and everything defended by 100,000 Japanese uh, in bunkers and underground. And so they decide to isolate Rabaul. And the whole campaign during the fall and winter of 43-44 is meant to destroy the capability of Rabaul being an offensive uh, place. And it works. By February of 44, ships don't come to Rabaul. Uh, there are no planes on the airfields. There's five major airfields. At one time, there were 300 planes stationed at Rabaul. Uh, they're either destroyed. The last uh, 40 or so are flown off to truck in February of 44, and that's the end of Rabaul as a major base. And they just leave it to wither on the vine. Uh, the only way the Japanese get supplies are submarines bring it in at night. And if you got 100,000 guys and you're bringing in supplies from submarines, you can tell it was uh, logistically a nightmare for the Japanese. They, they harvested their own fields of uh, food and uh, forced the natives and uh, prisoners like uh, Hazelwood and Lamphere to do the work for them. So, uh, the Marines of 215 will spend the entire third tour just flying from Bougainville up to uh, Rabaul. And sometimes they they first flew from Vela La Vela. You're talking seven hours in the air, uh, similar to the long range missions that they were doing over in uh, Europe, seven hours going up and back. And these are the three high scores of the squadron. I said again, scoring is a big deal. I have a chapter in my book, or not a chapter, but a section about uh, did they really shoot down as many planes as they said they did and kind of looks into that a little bit because they didn't have gun camera film. You depended on somebody else seeing whether your uh, victory went into the ocean or 
And a lot of them just, you know, spiraling down smoking. Well, uh, they could have recovered at a low altitude or anyway. But these guys had the highest scores. You have Hansen on the left, shot down 25. Aldrich in the middle, shot down 20. And Spears was given credit for 15. So between them, they shot down 60 Japanese planes. The uh, squadron as a whole, 135 and a half kills. So these are the big three. But within these squadrons, was there a amongst the pilots was there a competition to kind of um to, to to get the most kills because john brunning is coming on on saturday talking about the race of aces and and we talk often about the germans and their system in not in eto about creating these aces and how actually it's maybe not work it's in it's good for the individuals but maybe not good for the strategy as a whole in the u.s marine corps was it considered important or was it as you said earlier about the mission and the operations that that's what counted and, and then killed but it's kind of a a bonus. Well, uh, Bob Owens, who will end up being the last, his picture here where he was shot down supposedly by a Japanese plane, but all the pilots I know told me he was shot down by his own wingman, but that's another story. Uh, he told me that he had problems with several of the pilots wanted to go off and just be on their own. And he had to really work hard on that. Uh, they didn't all fly every day, which uh, many, uh, Hal Spears on their third tour, the first three times he was scheduled to fly, his flights were canceled due to weather. So he's a big scorer. He's going to end up with 15. Well, who knows if he would have had three more days over Rabal where it was a target rich environment. He may have shot down 20 or 25. Uh, so they rotated. They they uh, shared planes with another squadron. So every other day, the squadron flew, and they would only put up uh, three or four divisions. They might only fly 16 of their 28 pilots would get to go. So it wasn't like uh, – unfortunately, I've read John's book about the race for the aces, and people like uh, uh, McGuire and uh, – Who's the high scorer? Uh, our top pilot. Uh, can't remember his name now. But no, but we'll do that on Saturday. I, I can't remember yeah, either. But yeah, is the highest score. These guys, they were staff officers, and they would fly on their own whenever they felt like it. They just go off on their own and shoot up enemy airplanes. They were not part of a team, not part of anything. They were just out there to shoot down airplanes, and uh, they didn't do the strafing and the bombing and the day to day stuff that the other pilots did. Well, the Marines didn't have that. You flew the mission you were assigned, and everybody flew the same type of missions every day. There wasn't any favoritism. Uh, Bob Hansen, the guy who scored the most kills, he missed several missions against Rabal during those days where uh, it, you're putting up 150 American planes and 150 Japanese planes. And it's just, it's a melee and they're just shooting planes down left and right. Well, the guys that wanted to shoot down planes, they're out of luck. You don't fly today. You don't fly today. And guys come back and say, I got two, I got three, I got two. And you're sitting there chafing the tough luck. The Marines, maybe you're going to be the guy that goes off and strafes, you know, some other place and you don't get to do, or maybe you're scheduled for maintenance hops. Some people had to do stick around and fly test planes to make sure they were combat ready so uh, the marines were all about teamwork and bob owens said that he had to uh you know throttle some guys and say hey you go where you go and i tell you to go and the operations officer says you're strafing tomorrow you're strafing tomorrow and uh one of the pilots uh hap langstaff he's just uh uh if you're looking at the picture he's to the left rear of owens in his in his uh medical outfit there. Uh, Hap Langstaff was considered the best pilot of the entire squadron. And he may have shot down one plane. They're not sure. He may have shot down one. He didn't have the opportunities. The days he flew, mm -hmm. he didn't have the opportunities. Or he was there sometimes uh, close cover. You had to stick with the bombers. You didn't get to go out wide. You had to stay with the bombers the whole time. And he never had the opportunity. And when they started uh, these publications talking about Boyington's big scores 
and all these other guys getting big scores. Uh, somebody heard him talk and he said, Hey, let's load up the guns. I'll go against anybody there is. You want to go up right now? I'll take anybody on. And he was so frustrated because he never had the opportunities. Uh, there was a statistic I read in uh, uh, one of the Marine Corps publications said that 80% of Marine fighter pilots never saw an enemy plane. So your chances, there may have been the greatest fighter pilot of all in one of these squadrons, and he just never got the opportunity to show his stuff. Well, it's like you said at the beginning, Jeff, about, you know, the, the a tally is, not, is, is one means of assessing a, a pilot's career, but it's by no means the only method. And someone said there, sometimes the best pilots were those that stayed alive the longest. That's another way of, of measuring someone's success or what they can bring to the training of another generation of pilots. What they bring back as an instructor is important. So we have it when we talk about special forces, you know, the measuring some of the commando raids. What did they do on the ground? What did they do for morale? What did they do? Yeah, the, 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 the success or the uh, qualities of a fighter pilot are more than just enemy aircraft downed. It's a whole complex series of things which you have been explaining admirably. So, um, yeah, great, great answer that. Fantastic. So I'll, I'll let you finish off. Well, I uh, finish off with a couple slides here. You got... These are the nine of the 10 squadron aces. The uh, only one missing is Hanson, who was killed, like I said, strafing a radar station coming back on a mission. But these guys, uh, in this picture, all of these guys, except for uh, the one on the lower left, uh, Ed Hernan, and the one on the lower right, Frenchie Williams, all of these guys are original 215 pilots that left midway as a member of 215. So uh, you can see that the, the squadron developed its own pilots, developed its own. It, it wasn't that they, um, you know, uh, didn't work together well. They all, and if your uh, listener said the guys that lived through it, these guys lived through it, the eight of the 10 or seven of the 10 were original 215 pilots that became aces. And uh, the final group, 14 of the original uh, 36 uh, pilots uh, came back at the end of the third tour. 215 will stay in the, the number will stay in uh, the Solomon Islands, but the original uh, pilots, the original cadre will return after their third. And this, these are the guys that left Santa Barbara as members of the uh, first group, the uh, Bob Owens is the guy in the middle smiling and he was able to bring all these guys back and he himself was an ace and later uh, he contributed to a Marine Corps attempt to set a piston engine speed record across the United States so uh, a gifted pilot as well as leader and he ended up as a major general in the Marine Corps Wow. So, well, let's see what and then there's the, the final score uh, this is a board that was given to me by Hap, Hap Langstaff, the guy I told you that was probably the yeah. best of the pilots. And so this is their score uh, they attained. So that's my presentation. Well, absolutely brilliant. Um, well, thank you very much. It's been brilliant. We've got a couple of questions for you. So um, this one's actually about, the, about the, the Corsair. So Gary is asking, I read a few times that the F4U could drop its landing gear as diving brakes when dive bombing. What do you know about that? Was it really effectively used in combat? Yes. The, the uh, wheels would open just slightly as dive brakes and could be used as dive brakes. And they were used as dive brakes, especially... In the central Solomon or the central uh, Pacific, like the Marshalls, there were many Japanese islands that were bypassed. And so Marine squadrons basically plastered these bypassed islands until there was nothing left. There are no planes. There's no buildings. Mm -hmm. This is where they learned how to dive bomb, how to uh, fly the Corsair. And so they used them very effectively. And then when the invasion of the Philippines comes along, the Marines will be the number one uh, air support for the Army's retaking of the Philippines. Uh, um, both Corsairs, uh, uh, the uh, PBJs, the B-25s, uh, SBDs will be, in fact, SBDs will 
be actually flying artillery that when the army makes their run on Manila from their initial landing, they have one flank that is completely up in the air. There's no units on that side. They just have Marine Corps dive bombers on that side. So they'll cut their teeth, both uh, Corsairs and SPDs and ground support on these little islands. And you said you did a uh, presentation on Peleliu, and I never got to see the end of it. I started to watch it. Oh, uh, yeah, we've done two or three now. Yeah, but wait, yeah. that gives you some Marines. Time. They just kept the landing gear down. They never pulled yeah, up. They just, yeah, didn't, it was such short flight. So a uh, couple more right. questions. Bradley Neese is asking, how many missions did the average pilot fly for all three uh, flights? Uh, that's a good question because I don't. I never compiled a list. They flew the first two flights. They flew almost daily. So if you're talking six weeks, you're talking a lot of flights. And they're not air-to-air -air flights. Like I said, these are all kinds of different flights, escort flights, dive bombings. Or, well, they didn't dive bomb, but strafing. And uh, all just they flew constantly. Uh, yeah. The last tour... Most of them for that six week time, they probably only flew half the time during the six weeks because they were sharing planes with VMF 212. And because they had so many pilots at that time, they were up to 36 pilots from 28, which is what they started with. You didn't get to fly because they put up 22, 24 planes. So six or eight of the pilots from those divisions wouldn't fly plus extra pilots. So I have no idea knowing how many. But it's, it's again, it's, it's using the metrics. I mean, some of the people watching this, they may be thinking of the ETO when missions are long and lengthy. And this is a different thing where you're taking off in air almost for a few minutes, then landing. So it's a, it's a bit apples and oranges, but a great question. One from Pat, another aviation fan. Was Japanese anti-aircraft as much as a problem for them as it was to ground strafing allied fighters in the ETO? Yes, Japanese anti-aircraft fire was the number one cause of uh, loss for these guys. In fact, I told you about Kahili on the southern tip of Bougainville. Those guys at Kahili, there was a rumor, and, and uh, intelligence later said it was false, but the, the Japanese had actually put camouflage netting over the field and then cut down the trees underneath it so the entire field was covered by this camouflage netting with the tops of trees. And then the anti-aircraft guns were underneath that cover. Well, obviously that wasn't true because we have photos of the field that you can see the runway easily. But the runway, the Marines said, don't strafe Kahili. Don't let them talk you into strafing Kahili because that was the number one loss was strafing enemy positions. Uh, George Cross was shot down strafing Ricotta Bay. Bob Hansen was shot down strafing a radar station. They, the Japanese, they had small caliber anti-aircraft fire, and you had to go in low to strafe. Well, that was, a, I think, I'll ask one more question, and then we'll bring things in. So my question is going to be, in general, is there more work to be done by historians about this kind of ground support role of the Marine squadrons? Because, you know, when we've talked about it a lot, when people are attacking the Pacific campaign, even in the big trilogies of books, there's only so much you can fit in these massive great tomes. But do you think um, there is enough appreciation of the of the support that Marines did with with aircraft like the Corsair in the ground support ground support role? I think there's always room for more. There's, they did so, especially in the Central Pacific where they were doing these. Uh, there's a great video called Milk Run that was filmed during the war that shows they're taking off from a base in the Central Pacific, bombing a Japanese base that has absolutely no value. But they're learning how to dive bomb. They're learning the techniques. And after Bougainville was captured, they spent a lot of time on Bougainville perfecting these dive bombing techniques so that when they invade the Philippines, the Marines are there. Uh, I just wrote an article for Leatherneck Magazine about the uh, Marine dive bombing support, the, the diving dauntlesses of, of Luzon. And uh, there's a lot of stuff. 80% of the uh, flights in Korea will be done by Marine close support. Yeah. aircraft so 
it's there's a lot to do with that particular aspect of fighting. Well, brilliant. Well, we will bring things to an end, but it goes without saying that you are welcome back anytime to discuss one of the other things you've written about. You mentioned your articles you write. So, folks, I had a couple of questions in the sidebar about Jeff's book. Well, the links in the description below to Jeff's own website, and, of course, the, there are links to bookstore um, uh, versions of it, but you can buy his book at your know, whatever your favorite internet or retail bookstore is. And it's obviously... A, a nice one. It combines the people with the aircraft with the mission. So it's got a good kind of all round book. So um, fantastic stuff. So I'm just going to take you off screen for a second to say what we've got coming up tomorrow. And I'll bring you back in a second. So folks, tomorrow, James M. Scott is back for, I think, show number four, maybe show number three about his new book, uh, Black Snow. So we're back to talk about the 1945 era and the firebombing of Tokyo. So lots of talk about Curtis LeMay and and uh, some of those other figures there. But James Scott, as you know, is always good value. So that's tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday, I'm not sure there's going to be a show Wednesday yet. I'm still trying to get in touch with a, with a, the presenter. We'll see about that. Then Thursday, we've got uh, Kamika, uh, Royal Navy, so British Royal Navy uh, counter kamikaze measures coming. Will we'll I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. Will Iredale, and then we've got John Brunning coming on, and there's one more show. I forgot what it is on top of my head, but oh, Trent Hone is coming on talking about his new biography of Nimitz and how Nimitz was a master logistics and how some of that comes into the mastery of the Pacific campaign. So a lot of stuff coming up your way. And then we have Arnhem Week, but between this week and Arnhem Week, I'm off for a week to do some filming for a TV thing that's coming up. So I'm, you've got six days without me. But I'm going to bring Jeff back in just to say, well, thanks very much. So, Jeff, that was an extraordinarily uh, fantastic uh, premiere performance on uh, World War II TV. So I, I can't wait to see you again. So um, thank you very much for joining us. So Thank you, Paul. appreciate it. Thank you. So this is Paul Burdett, World War II TV, saying I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, and thank you for your attention today. Cheers. Bye.